All right, today we're going to talk about the most common cause of joint pain, osteoarthritis. Here's a case. A 52-year-old man presents with acute on chronic right knee pain. Now, he has intermittently had knee pain for about five years, worse after activity with morning stiffness for up to 15 minutes every day. This past Saturday, he spent much of the day helping his son move into his college dorm, and the next morning, he reports that his right knee is swollen and painful, denies any fevers or chills, no other involved joints. His pain is worst at the medial aspect of the knee. Initial vitals, completely unremarkable. And then on gross inspection, we see symmetric bony enlargement of the knees. On range of motion testing, his right knee is limited to about 90 degrees of flexion. It's limited by pain and stiffness, and you do note some crepitus on exam. On palpation of the right knee, we find a tender medial joint line. No pain over the pes anserine bursa, no increased warmth, and a small effusion is present. All right, so let's highlight some of the important features of this case. It sounds like this is an acute on chronic issue. He's had pain for five years, but something seems to have made it worse over the past day or so. The pattern of joint involvement is also important. It sounds like it's asymmetric. It's mostly involving just one knee. And of course, it's monoarticular. Next up, in terms of joint inflammation, well, on the one hand, we have swelling and we have a painful joint, which tends to make us think of joint inflammation. We'll probably end up having to get an arthrocentesis to see how inflamed this joint really is. And then next up, systemic involvement. Well, review of systems is completely unrevealing. We're not getting any fevers or any evidence of any other systemic illness. So I think we can say there's no systemic involvement. So with that history in mind, what is the most likely diagnosis? Well, let's start with pseudogout. Pseudogout, as you may recall, is also CPPD, calcium pyrophosphate deposition, and it is a relatively common type of crystalline arthropathy. Most importantly, the most common joint affected in CPPD is the knees. Now, we'd want to ask about some other common risk factors for pseudogout, like hyperparathyroidism, hemochromatosis, I like to think of that as iron, hyper iron, and then hypomag or hypophosphatemia. Of course, only an arthrocentesis is really going to help us to include or exclude that diagnosis. We'll keep a question mark there for now. And then osteoarthritis. As I said at the beginning of this talk, it's the most likely diagnosis because it's the most common cause of pain. Typically, it can have an acute on chronic picture. Knee involvement is very common. And even this description of bony enlargement of the bilateral knees leads us towards that diagnosis. But what about this effusion issue? Can that happen with osteoarthritis? I think we'll have to leave a question mark in that box for now. Next up, rheumatoid arthritis. Now, we need to consider rheumatoid arthritis, though there are some things that are going to conflict with that diagnosis. First of all, it's monoarticular. We tend to expect to have symmetric findings. You expect to see more stiffness. He's saying he's only stiff for 15 minutes in the morning. We'd want to see stiffness for 30 minutes to nearly an hour. And also, we don't have any systemic symptoms at all. The effusion, however, would be pretty typical of rheumatoid arthritis, so I think we'll just keep that on the list for now as well. Next up is patellar tendinopathy. Now, remember, patellar tendinopathy is also known as jumper's knee. It's basically inflammation, swelling, and even potentially thickening of the tendon that attaches the distal patella to the tibial tuberosity, as shown in this image here. It's typically an overuse injury, most common in athletes. It would typically cause anterior knee pain rather than medial knee pain, and it would be pretty unusual in a middle-aged non-athlete. So I think it's safe for us to take that one off the list. Next up, pesanserine bursitis. Now, there are several bursa, it can get kind of complicated, that surround the knee, including, shown here, the suprapatella, the prepatella, and the infrapatella bursa. In addition, not depicted here because of the plane of this image, is the pes anserine bursa, which lies just distal to the medial joint line of the knee on both sides. The bursa in general serve as soft buffers between tendons and hard bony surfaces, protecting tendons from wear and tear. When they become inflamed from overuse, 
Occasionally from immune-mediated inflammation, and more rarely from infection, the bursa can become exquisitely painful, swollen, and warm to the touch. Now, as I said, the pes anserine bursa is medially located, which is where our patient is experiencing pain, but again, it's about two centimeters distal from the medial joint line, distal to the medial tibial plateau. So really, a good physical exam should be able to distinguish between tenderness at the medial joint line versus tenderness distal to that at the pes anserine bursa. And we were given a pretty thorough exam, so I think we can safely rule out pes anserine bursitis as well. So, we're left with pseudogout, osteoarthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Looks like we're going to need an arthrocentesis to tease this apart. Okay, so here's our results. No crystals, that's reassuring. Cell count is 1,300 nucleated cells, and gram stain is negative, culture is no growth, in case we were ever considering aseptic arthritis. Let's look at that cell count and try and put that into perspective. So, here's a nice schematic showing how to interpret the synovial fluid cell count. It looks like our cell count of 1,300 is going to put us into the non-inflammatory column here on the far left of the spectrum, which supports osteoarthritis after all. Here's the key point. While it's unusual to have acute synovitis with an effusion like osteoarthritis, it definitely happens and can certainly look at first like an inflammatory arthritis. But the key clues here are a relatively cool effusion, which is how it was described in our HPI, compared with a hot effusion you might see with septic arthritis or gout. Also, this patient had no systemic symptoms, which would lead us away from something like rheumatoid arthritis. And lastly, this cell count of less than 2,000 is going to definitely push us into the non-inflammatory category. Remember, things like gout are typically going to have 20 to 80,000 cells, and a septic arthritis is certainly going to be more than 50,000 cells, potentially as high as 100,000 cells. All right, final point, blend synovial fluid, less than 2,000 cells, think osteoarthritis. So what causes osteoarthritis? This one's easy. Despite being the most common chronic degenerative joint disease afflicting nearly everybody over the age of 50, the etiology of osteoarthritis remains completely unknown. We do, however, at least know some of its risk factors. Anyone over the age of 65 has osteoarthritis, and oftentimes it can start considerably earlier. Female gender is a risk factor, any family history, prior joint trauma, and certainly obesity by virtue of excess wear and tear on those joints. In addition, osteoarthritis can be secondary to other disease processes like diabetes, hemochromatosis, acromegaly, and even gout can cause osteoarthritic types of manifestations. So let's go back to our case for a moment and look for some key features. We have an acute on chronic picture, very typical for osteoarthritis, worse after activity, but morning stiffness lasting for less than 15 minutes, also typical of osteoarthritis. The swollen joint can happen as an acute synovitis on a backdrop of chronic osteoarthritis. It's not common, but it does certainly happen. Bony enlargement of the knees due to these osteophytic growths around the bees is common, especially on radiographs. And the fact that you have tenderness on the medial joint line also supports that condition. So to recap, classic features of osteoarthritis are those we had in our case, a chronic disease with periodic flares typically precipitated by increased activity. You're also looking for asymmetric symptoms and with inexorable progression, osteoarthritis of some joints can literally bring many people to their knees. See what I did there? Now, it has a predilection for certain joints, like the knees, the hips, the lumbar spine, and of course, shown here on the left, the proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal joints of the fingers. Classic physical exam findings, as I alluded to, are going to be bony enlargement, a limited range of motion, varus deformity, which means being somewhat bow-legged, crepitus by uh, palpating the knee while moving it, and of course, joint line tenderness, as I mentioned. So let's take a look at some of the common radiographic features of osteoarthritis. The picture on the left here is a normal radiograph of a knee, and then the one on the right is somebody with severe osteoarthritis. What you can see right off the bat, the first distinguishing feature is the joint space narrowing, particularly in the medial compartment of the knee. In addition, you can see evidence of subchondral sclerosis, which is that hyperlucent areas just on the tibial plateau, 
There's evidence of subchondral cysts in there as well. And osteophytes basically broaden the size of the knee relative to the size of the tibial plateau.